Okay, we're we're live now. Um, yeah, we're live now. Cool. All right. So this session is looking at how we extend the well-being concept in Asia and how we make it more equitable and democratic, more people. Um, I'm hosting this session and my name is Peter Marion and I'm the founder of Future Narrative, a strategic futures agency. And I'm joined by Andy and Jarvis. Andy, maybe you would like to kick off first by uh, introducing yourself and what you do and your definition of well-being. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, so my name's Andy Hapamaka, which uh, you probably notice it's, it's a Swiss Swiss name. The Britain accent is, is British. So, uh, I, I probably work in, in the space of what could be called neural leadership, which is applying the, the science of the brain or the, the cognitive sciences to, to leadership scenarios. Having said that, you know, a lot of my, a lot of my work looks at the brain in general and behavior in general, you know, and that includes, and a lot of work we've done, we've done a bunch of research, which is obviously around mental well-being and cognitive, cognitive, the cognitive science and well-being in general. So this is kind of like a big theme or theme that comes up quite, quite often in our work. We've done a bunch of research also about it. So, and you know, there's, there's been a lot of talk uh, in, the, in the West um, that's come up about well-being and what well-being is, and, you know, how do you define it and do you define it in terms of health, you know. And we've actually come to define it in, in terms of, you know, what we call neuropsychological needs or psychological needs uh, or emotional needs. Uh, and these are a bunch of needs uh We've defined, which have been very well documented in, in, in many areas, in many of the sciences, psychological sciences, behavioral sciences, well-being surveys, and it's around self-esteem, having self-esteem, value appreciation, and around control, having control, autonomy, uh, around orientation, knowing things, around attachment, and around having pleasure in life. And basically, our model simply says, if you have that. Uh, you're going to be in a good place. <laughs> and if you don't have that, you're going to be in a bad place. So that's kind of like a, a very simple. So rather than worrying of about many other factors that we could could consider as a simple, but if you have that, you're going to be in a good place. If you don't have it, you can be in a bad place. Now you can apply that then to to any sort of you know model, be it uh, meditative practices or you know the other models you can apply in the business world you can apply it in, in in a private life you can apply it to societies you can apply it to all sorts of things so you know that, that's what we're saying if you have that you're going to be a good place if you don't have the motion you're going to be in a bad place and so rather than thinking about methodologies and practices we say we look at that and that translates back into what's happening in the brain and all the chemicals and all the good things and bad things that can be coming out of it yeah and how does that, I guess, align with the physical as well? Because I guess when we're talking about things from a very holistic perspective, you know, there's lots of things that have obviously changed, particularly over the last couple of years when we think about the pandemic and things like that. You know, I think I feel like a lot of the stuff that you were talking about there was very relational and human in terms of the neuroscience side of things. But how does the physical body play into all of those things as well? Yeah, I mean, that's that, that's an interesting question, one that comes up quite a lot, because people say, oh, Andy, you deal with the brain, but you don't deal with the body. But actually, what we say, our, our model says, you know, it, it's all one system. Mm. Uh, so actually, we say it, it's a brain-body system, and everything fits back into everything. Your brain has multiple sensors connected to, to the body, connected to the heart, connected to the stomach. A uh, lot of work recently coming out of the scientific community, for example, on the gut-brain Access and how your microbiome influences that. So, so we see it as as one model. So, I, you know, I regularly look at and do stuff around that as well, uh, which is saying obviously healthy in mind, healthy in body, or healthy in body, healthy in mind. It, it is a and it is and science is saying that very very clearly. Is it's 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 a dual way system, and you do have to work on both sides of it. Right? And I want to move to you, Jarvis. Uh, can you please introduce yourself and, and tell me a little bit about your sort of perspective on uh, well-being as well? Oh, yes, yes, definitely, of course. 
Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jarvis. I'm based in London, you know, for our family business. Um, so I first joined the family business, uh, uh, business, you know, back in early um, January 2017. So it's been uh, several years. So we mainly just assist our, you know, clients to expand uh, business operations globally. So I used to um, to work in the field of finance. Um, so, um, so, um, so um, I think well-being, you know, has been a really, you know, hot topic um, across Asia, especially, um, you know, uh, the economic developments, you know, in the region, uh, you know, has, you know, um, grown uh, in rapidly in, in the in the last decade or so. So a lot of people, especially the middle class, you know, uh, are really concerned about uh you know uh the ongoing well being. So um um in terms of um in terms of um uh, uh finances um especially uh when uh for the younger generation, a lot of companies, you know, uh, just um, in the field, especially insurance companies, they have uh, developed, you know, their own uh, set of scheme, uh, okay. in just in the hope of uh, encouraging more people um, um, to be um, to be healthy, um, to be um, to be um, to be um, uh, in in the best interest of their own um, uh, health. Issues. Um, say, for example, uh, you know, uh, the, the UK based, uh, insurance company, uh, Vitality, you know, uh, uh which has encouraged, um, more po policy holders, you know, um, to, um, to work out more, to exercise more. In return, um, they get, uh, they give them cash. They give them, uh, uh, any rewarding, uh, scheme such as, you know, um, uh, uh, Coffee, uh, coupons, uh, you know, food coupons, you know, so far, so far, and so forth. Yeah. And I guess in that, there's lots of all sorts of um, implications for that sort of thing because it takes on a very much perspective of prevent pre preventative medicine rather than curative because you're getting to the problem before it becomes a problem. Is that is that a fair assessment? Oh yeah, I, I do think uh, that's a very fair assessment. Um, you know, because um, because you know, in practice, um, um, financially, especially such big insurance companies, they do want to prevent you know things uh, from happening at the beginning. Um, say for example, um, uh, uh, high pro high blood pressure, you know, is a common same just among uh, yes among the people uh in uh, in their 40s or 50s so if you know um so if we could prevent that just you know uh, uh from happening just in 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 the first place you know i think they will be a really bit safe uh for um yeah for the consumers you know as well as for such big uh, insurance companies Absolutely. And also for employers as well. Like I've seen lots of schemes that have started to open up where employers are uh, giving uh, employees benefits if they start to be more healthy and do things like that around those sort of preventive medicines. Um, but like, I guess looking back at like some of the Asian healing modalities and traditional um, health processes, things like traditional Chinese medicine, a lot of those things are really um, emphasized around that idea of prevention rather than cure and, and creating a more holistic and long-term view. And Andy, I wanted to take it back to you and, and talk about some of the neuroscience work that you've been doing around how some of the, you know, how, how do you create uh, conditions for optimum performance and things like that from a preventative perspective rather than waiting for things, I guess, like what we've been seeing over the last couple of years, where there's been, you know, these huge mental health crises um, through the pandemic and through the disconnection and all those sorts of imbalances that you were talking about a minute ago, uh, really sort of becoming apparent to societies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now the pandemic has, I have to have to kind of like, it's it's has a very interesting dynamic from from a mental health perspective, um, and there's been different, uh, you know, in different parts of society, there's been people saying, "Oh my God, we're going to have a mental health pandemic," or you know, it's a new crisis. Teenagers can't cope, or um, so on and so forth. Um, but there's been a very interesting, or interesting, 
but uh, it's fa- it is fascinating on one level. So we did an analysis. Now, of course, this was based in Europe. This is European com- companies, mostly multinationals. Uh, and we did um, an analysis, which include measuring emotional needs and answer measuring you know, stress in the workplace. Uh, we've got comparable data from 2012 to 2014. Uh, and what we found is the vast majority of people were in a better place <laughs> than in 2012 to 2014 by a significant amount, with one noticeable area of disruption, which is orientation. That's knowing what's happening, which mm-hmm. is, you know, it's been, it's been it's been a feature of the pandemic. You know, everyone's been sitting around going, oh, my God, we're in lockdown. How am I going to happen? What's going to happen? When are we going to come out? Are we going to come out? Are we going into second lockdown? Now we're into fourth lockdown in some, in, in some countries. Austria next to us have just gone into fourth lockdown. Um, so, so, but it's really surprising. We were surprised. You know, we were expecting to see kind of like massive drops, you know, and all sorts of frustration. So what we found was this, the majority of people, I have to stress this as kind of like corporate multinational sort of environments where they're pretty well set up for virtual work. They've been working in some way or shape or form. They've had, you know, virtual global teams for a long time, but they have just haven't had kind of full home office mm. um we did find a small section of the people who were in were in a worse place it's, and it was very dependent on, on personal situations but the majority of people it increased because there were a number of stresses which were immediately taken away you know which were things like uh you know the commute which we know is uncomfortable but people were suddenly find an extra hour or two a day uh people are in comfortable situations you could have have a meeting, then stroll around in your slippers and go and get yourself a cup of coffee. And, you know, if it was not comfortable meeting, you could chill out. And so for, for example, uh, <laughs> so we actually found that there are pockets uh, of, of stress, uh, but actually the majority of people, and I do stress this, but this corporate were actually a surprising good place. Um, but of, of course, there is kind of a like long tail event there potential long tail events, which is this kind of underlying stress factor. And again, it's like this uncertainty, which is kind of continuing and continuing. Uh, it's dependent on personal situations, local situations. And there's kind of other factors which start to diminish over time, uh, which is if you've had a good team, you know, good attachment, good relationships, and then go to a virtual working context, it still works very well. But if you haven't had the ability to bond and build relationships, uh, you know, it then becomes a factor and then becomes impacts, you know, does impact, you know, the, the, the way you deal with the world and stress, hence well-being. You know, having relationships is really important. Um, but then it also impacts like corporate productivity. You know, you're dealing with people you've never really interacted with previously or how, how does that operate? So we've also stressed there could be long tail events happening out of this. Um, but of course, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, I mean, I guess in the two things that really um, jumped out at me as you were speaking there were, I guess, a sense of control over your circumstances. <laughs> Um, and that's sort of really driving well-being and being at home created a new set of control metrics that perhaps you didn't have. And then I guess the other thing with the new teams is really around trust. Is that is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and this is a kind of interesting. We had, you know, some of the, the data we also had or analysis was in the financial crisis going back, you know, many, many years now. Yeah. People lost control then because companies took away corporate autonomy. You know, they, 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 they really stressed down the people, created more regulations, created more controls, said, we're taking control of the business. You know, you have to do this now. And in this situation, people had massively increased autonomy. It was kind of like, just get the work done <laughs> however you want and wherever you want and just do it. You know, so people yes. had suddenly had massively increased autonomy. And this is reflected in our measures, which actually is as the majority of people are doing surprisingly well. Even though people are kind of griping about different things, the actual the actual stress levels are relatively low for a, a lot of people. Uh, yeah, and I think that, and I, I would probably like caveat that with a, a sense of like that. Obviously, the way that you're talking about that is that people in multinational corporations, where um, if you start to think about perhaps some of those people outside of those structures, like 
Gen Zers that might have lost jobs and stuff like that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And this is, you know, we did and have data on that, and yes. again, I've, I've, I've analysed bunches of other data though. But even bunches of other data, we found that there's obviously certain groups, and if you're kind of like, you know, in a certain jobs, now this this of course could be, you know, very. Uh, very significant in Asia with kind of like, you know, large groups of, let's say, lower paid jobs, mm. you know, people just do not have the facilities as well. You know, we had, you know, one client, you know, also so based in, uh, I believe, in Malaysia, Indonesia. Uh, and, you know, they just didn't have people who had this kind of like real ability, for example, to, 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 to run Zoom meetings at home because they were in kind of one room with three other people, members of the family and so on and so forth. So it's, it, it is obviously... Uh, collection dependent. A uh, bunch of stuff came out with teenagers and school as well. Uh, and actually, if you look into the detail, there's a lot of teenagers having a problem. Most teenagers weren't having a problem, but it's very socioeconomic. There's almost socioeconomic cutoff points there, mm-hmm. you know, whereas uh, underprivileged children were having significant problems. But anyone who was in a reasonable, you know, home private situation socioeconomically. So that, of course, also, is very concerning. Also, though, for for for, for governments things because it's kind of like a socio economic cutoff that if you're in a sort of situation where you can't afford to have, you know, where you don't have the structures at home to be able to deal with homeschooling, for example, it becomes problematic, and that's obviously very concerning as well. Yeah, absolutely, and especially as we're sort of talking about um, markets developing and some of those markets not being as necessarily as developed, and so you know a lot of those markets would be in houses where there'd be sort of multi generational households and stuff like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, thinking about things like nine nine six culture and the impact that that has on well being in some of the Asian markets, particularly around well-being, how do we see that kind of evolving and and people thinking about that now in terms of well-being? Jarvis, do you have an opinion on this? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, You know, the 996 uh, working hour system is actually a work schedule practiced by many companies, you know, in China. So um, so it really does, um, you know, derive uh, from this requirement, you know, that employee work from from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., you know, which is relatively long, you know, uh, from, you know, uh, from a perspective um, of European standards, I, I would say. Um, so um, 9 to 6 um, is really a common theme um, uh, in so many uh, Asian countries. Um, mm. um, say, for example, uh, uh, in terms of European standard, we do have like a maximum uh, working, uh, 40 hours, you know, uh, per week, um, you know, mm. which is um, required uh, b- uh, by the law in the relevant jurisdictions. But um, so many Asian countries, you know, uh, or territories, they don't have such regulation. Say, for example, uh, Hong Kong, one of the most advanced economies in Asia, um, they don't have like um, uh, a law uh, which stipulates that uh, the ma- the maximum numbers of hours you know people can work um, per week. So the the other example is that. Um, uh, in Japan, a lot of people, you know, they commit suicides because of, you know, excessive stress um, in relation to um, working hours. Um, um, yes, um, but I would say in terms of um, uh, economic development, you know, a lot, a lot of um, governments, you know, they put emphasis um, uh, just on the economy over the well-being of uh, of their citizens, you know, I think uh, um, uh, there will be uh, an issue, you know, for us to to uh, um, to address uh, for in the coming years or so. And um, why do you think? Um, I mean, in terms of like, I guess the impact on a society or a culture on emphasizing the um, economic benefits over a person's human well-being. What do you think the long-term effects of that are on a society? I think the long term uh effect on the society is that um a lot of people, you know, uh you know, they might just de- develop um psychological uh, uh 
chronic uh, issues as in the long term. Say, for example, uh, you might you you might have anxiety um, just um, just uh, within yourself, and you and you don't notice that um, you know um, just you know uh, in work uh, in, in your social life uh, or even in, um, in your family life. Um, so a lot of people are. Uh, you know, like couldn't just um, control a temper, um, just in relation to um, to excessive uh, pressure, um, just you know, um, coming from workplaces. Um, I would say, um, I would say, um, in terms of um, developing uh, well-being schemes in the future for 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 companies or. Um, uh, governments, you know, they should always put the emph- the uh, the emphasis um, just um, just on psychological well being over you know economic benefits. Uh, yeah, for yeah, for for employees and citizens. And did you have a view on any of this? Yeah, you know, I, I think some of this is, is a little short sighted, and I think that, that there's kind of like obviously an understanding and the natural. Uh, natural will to get this economy, economic engine going. But I think, you know, some of the things we look at is, is also cognitive decision making, how people make false decisions or suboptimal decisions. Yeah. You know, and this is kind of like intuitively sounds like a good thing, or intuitively as a there's gut feeling which says, Ooh, yeah, more work, better, more production, good for economy. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but like, you know, if you think about things from a very on one level, uh, a strong economy means more people in a middle class, which means, you know, better outcomes on another n- a number of other levels. So I guess, yeah, anyway, sorry, continue. But uh, like- absolutely. So, so it's, it's kind of, the reason is it's short-sighted for multiple reasons, because if the only thing you can do is work, you can't contribute to the economy in other ways, <laughs> you know, which is, you know, you know free time pay. You, know, you could argue some people may not be yes, like in the middle class where they have, you know, you know, free time free wealth but there's, there's multiple other factors that that can be influenced so i think it's it, it's very short term and not if we talk, talk about a health factors a holistic in that sense because you're contributing to other factors in the economy if people are not working nine to nine six days a week they're doing other stuff or spending money or contributing to the economy in other ways and then there's going to obviously going to be long tail events where it's so it's about hyper you know and then all these Kind of classically considered Western diseases, which are hypertension, diabetes, start you know, uh, you know, exploding or mushrooming in, in those countries. Then you suddenly have, you know, a, 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 another crisis to deal with, which costs you know immense amounts of money and loses immense amounts of productivity. So I think it, it's 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 not a very well thought through process. And again, you can understand that you know governments are kind of concerned, you know. The, getting this economic engine running. Uh, but I think same with, you know, Western companies looking at some of these some of these factors we're dealing with. So sometimes less is more. Mm, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And um, I think one of the things when we were talking about this beforehand, we were sort of talking about this, I guess, cross-pollination of ideas uh, between the different uh, cultures, so between West and East in terms of, you know, healing methodologies, you know, yoga and Ayurveda and Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine are now very popular in Western countries. And some of uh, the Western ideas are obviously flowing back into Eastern cultures as well. And w- where do we see, I guess, some of the, where do we see this come uh, to uh, sort of um, playing out moving forward? And what are some of the risks that um, maybe some of the Eastern cultures might face and Asian cultures might face as, um, as they take on more Western elements? Yeah, I suppose I, ideally we'd, 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 we'd hope there'd be like this, this perfect merge of, of, of these factors, you know, but, but there's a risk of just taking pockets of each and, you know, doing it in, in some sort of mismatched kind of sort of sort of fashion, whereas uh, ideally we'd say, okay, there's really good things coming out, you know, from the East and there's kind of like really good knowledge in the West and ideally we'd merge it seamlessly to where we combine you know, different, for example, meditative practices, which, you know, is obviously happening in, also in the workplace, uh, with kind of, you know, good, good knowledgeable classic school medicine for, 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 you know, acute 
acute diseases or acute situations such as COVID now. <laughs> um, uh, but there's also a danger, and I, I say this danger is that kind of you run, as we just discussed with this 996 work culture, you run headlong into some of the mistakes that the West has already made <laughs> uh, and then, then just play catch up again. So, so ideally we'd, we'd like to see it merge because there's you know, very good uh, practices which are kind of like widespread in Eastern culture, which are good to take on, not just for Westerners, but for the, for the East to keep, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you know, not just jump head on and say, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're industrialized, we're, we're, we're Westernized, let's jump straight into into this uh, so i think there's um you know a certain risk uh there as well that's we're going to ignore some of the good features of uh of, of some of those kind of like eastern eastern practices Shavis, what's your take on it oh yes yes of course um you know um try traditional um asian uh uh Medical therapies such as, um, acupuncture, um, you know, uh, are really common just in the West. Um, so, um, so, so for our group of companies, you know, operating in, in Europe, we do offer our employees, you know, um, Chinese, um, traditional medicine, um, um, you know, as part of our, you know, um, in, employee benefits so um say for example um so if um so um so if you want to have like um uh acupuncture um um just you know um you know from our cooperative um you know uh medical companies you know we can offer that um to our uh staff uh, in the long run um so it's all part of our uh you know uh re uh, remuneration scheme um so um yes yes um so um from my um from my experience um living in singapore and hong kong uh, uh over the last 20 years or so um uh, some of uh, some of um some of these traditional asian therapies you know uh, have kind of like been forgotten um by a lot of people um and uh you know they do um they do tend to um um to to to, to go for western uh you know uh medicine um just um just you know uh um um so uh, so in, in in my in my point of view uh, i think the traditional uh Therapies, you know, uh, should prevail, should prevail, um, just over, um, uh, medicines just in the long run. So it's much more easier for them. Uh, and so, and, and, and it's also easier, um, not to have so many side effects in the long term. Yeah, and I think one of the things I've sort of seen some data on very recently is particularly in mainland China amongst sort yeah. of younger people, like, uh, post zero zero culture is that there's there's a renewed in, uh, interest in traditional method, medicine particularly yeah. even now as they're coming through the pandemic because um it kind of feels like you get a sense of control over your health because it's that yeah. kind of preventative and holistic view as well now i think yeah. i thought we had a question maybe from edgar in the audience edgar did okay. you want to ask that question uh if you still if you're still here i don't know he popped up on the wants to take the mic here we go I will okay. try and give it to you. Have I? Let's see if it's happening. Edgar, can you can you speak now? Oh yeah, uh, we've got Edgar. Hi. <laughs> yeah, he's online. Okay. okay. Hi. How are you? Okay. Good. Uh, how are you? Good morning. Uh, great. Great. Thank you. Good morning from the Philippines, Jarvis, uh, Andy, and Peta. Thanks Hello. for the invitation. Yeah. Um, Again, uh, just some some thoughts from the Philippines. Uh, I identify myself with the uh, with the uh, rural setting. Um, I I am into plantation agriculture. So if you guys eat mm -hmm. uh, some nicely looking bananas, whether it, the brand is Chiquita or Dole or Del Monte, well, um, our our labor might be in that in that banana. So uh, we export to Japan, Middle East. And also to Iran, uh, China, of course, and um, just some insights on the, the theme. Uh, if I have like a minute, Please. Um, 
we, we talk about well-being and wellness, which is really very important to us. And uh, what's the definition of well-being and wellness in the Asian perspective or East perspective and the West perspective? And when we say the, the poor of Asia or other parts of the world as well, what is the perspective? Because nowadays, especially with the advent of COVID, many of us have become so-called poor because we lost our jobs. Our banana plantations, for example, have stopped operations. 10,000 people lost their jobs. But we've been keeping tab of, did anybody die of hunger because they lost their jobs? Many they didn't lose their job. The farm is still there, but they wouldn't work because there's no salary. So we are not really looking for jobs. We are looking for salary. But if there's no salary, one month delayed in salary, then the workers will not work. It's a different, we have been oriented into working for a pay, not working because we have to be productive. And uh, <clears throat> so now we say we are poor in terms of money, which may be, as they say, the lowest form of wealth. But we are really very rich in terms of having hope in our hearts because we are breathing fresh air, not air from out of the ventilator or ox oxygen tank. As uh, Jarvis yes. mentioned about the acupuncture, the traditional, I mean, it's a discussion in this room, I guess, uh, uh, the traditional way of staying healthy, of, of letting ourselves uh, um, be treated, not by the external doctor who we appreciate, not by the hospital who we also appreciate, which we appreciate, but by that <clears throat> magnificent system inside us. Well, the West would call it, Modern day would call it the immune system. But in whatever language, maybe the Chinese has a different language for that, the immune system. In the Philippines, we have our own word for that. So <clears throat> maybe we can say we are not really poor. We don't have money. We, are, we may be begging for food if we really there's, there's nothing to cook. We may be begging for money to buy medicine if... Our, our mindset is to go to the pharmacy to buy medicine instead of plucking some uh, herbs at the, at the backyard, uh, boil them. Because after all, what is inside that Lipton pack called tea, but it's leaves, mm. preserved, packaged. Um, we don't have food, but <clears throat> nowadays, what do we define as food? Uh, somebody told me what we actually have are products labeled as food. And reminds me of, you know, we say what's very, very popular in the Philippines, especially in the rural communities, is what we call three in one, four in one, five in one. You know, it becomes like a sort of class. If you have a visitor, then you must be able to serve a three in one coffee. But then now comes the doctor saying, stay away from three in one. I mean, the doctors who are, who think that way, stay away from three in one because you're diabetic, you have high blood sugar. So what's wrong? It's supposed to be healthy. It's supposed to be good. But that is nicely labeled. Never mind the brands. And if you look at the back of the packet of the, the sachet, in the list of ingredients, it's not really three ingredients because three in one is supposed to be coffee and sugar and uh, good sugar, hopefully, uh, coffee, sugar, and creamer. Mm. But if you look at the back, there's like 11 different words. You don't even understand yeah. what they are. Well, I mean, that's, we and, and I guess that ties back to what we were talking about, which was really around that idea of some of the things from the West being imported <laughs> to Asian countries and, and them not being uh, positive or helpful because they're taking away from fresh ingredients and things like that. But I, we've got 10 minutes left. And one of the things, and, and Edgar, please uh, continue to stay with us if you would uh, prefer. Um, but um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is really, I guess, the nature of community and connection in terms of how we uh, how we maintain well-being in communities. Um, so how important is it, these community connections, particularly through times of concern and things like that? I mean, and you sort of talked about it a little bit around corporate uh, sense of trust. So maybe if you would like to talk about sort of how we connect with each other and how important that is to our mental well-being and, and also physical well-being as well. I guess it's the, um, the discussions. And maybe it's a, 
there, there's, there's a always a um, I don't want to call it a conflict, but it's just a different agenda. I belong to the corporate sector, plantation agriculture, and <clears throat> I, to be to be let's just say blunt, uh, to be honest. I don't want to say to be honest because we're supposed to be honest all the time anyway. But in our operation, we use chemicals that are not necessarily ideal in so far as I'm concerned. Because why do people who spray those chemicals look like robots? They are all over. You know, they even have uh, these helmets, and those are poisons meant not to poison the people. But if they inhale it, then uh, that also harms them. So I guess uh, how do we connect this? Uh, on the well-being of the people, it involves corporate players like me, for example, in our banana plantation. On a per- what I'm saying is on a personal basis. But then, uh, we even advertise them as healthy products. Mm. But those are not necessarily healthy as a matter of fact. I know that, uh, well, I have all the justifications to say that, well, these are FDA approved, these are uh, approved by the authorities as uh, tolerable. We use words like that. So mm-hmm. maybe it's just the, the the nature of our world now. And on that question, it's really upon us. There's no answer uh, that's uh, that can be given with finality. I don't know if I addressed that correctly. That's okay. I'm going to ask Andy the same question. I'll pass it back to Andy. So, Andy, when we're talking about community and connection, how do we feel uh, that 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 is sort of engaging with um, our well-being? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's incredibly important. And, you know, there's lots of research that had that, had that contribute. And again, what you can see in kind of like, you know, societies, I mean, Edward talked about it, that this sense of community and connection, it can, you know, is incredibly important and incredibly important to well-being. Studies in the West, you know, also, also come back. And if you look at studies into dementia and old age, there's a very strong correlation towards how much community and connection you can have, which reduces, you know, the, the, the impact or the uh, massively reduces the risk for, for, for neurodegenerative disorders later in life. So there's kind of like these things, this where I say, you know, you know, thinking of these models is, is kind of really important, you know, and we, we've developed our model, as I said, you know, with those five needs. But, you know, we've analyzed other models which have also been used in, um, one model we we analysed, which is one which has been used in the development of, uh, uh, of of agricultural societies. Now, of course, you have different aspects. Uh, you know, Edgar mentioned you know the risk of you know loss of income and starvation, which we don't have that concern generally in in the West. It's not that it's unknown. It's only losing job, but we have safety nets and. and Way to control that. So there's kind of like different stresses and different factors. But again, yeah, on the on the other side, you have kind of like maybe kind of super strong communities uh, which bond together and help each other in, in different ways that we also do not have uh, in in the West. Um, but again, I you know I, I see this kind of like fact of you know couldn't we just merge these things? You know, keep that you know great sense of community, but. <laughs> You know, build some other knowledge around that, you know, uh, and then if we have the perfect merging, you know, we'd have the good knowledge, uh, you know, the good science from classically considered Western, uh, which could be the science of the chemicals, or the impact of how those chemicals are having, you know, the risk factors involved in that, uh, you know, acute diseases, you know, combined with some of those positive factors, as, say, you know, as you said, rich in your heart. You know, from the rich in heart, which which contributes obviously to, to your well-being. That's for sure. And Jarvis, do you have a take on any of this around sort of how important community is for well-being um, across all all mark all community all uh, areas? Oh yes, yes. Um, I think I think the main difference uh, between uh, uh, between the in interpretation of well-being and wellness. Uh, be, uh, between the West and the East is that um, in West, um, in um, just in um, just in the West, um, people turn to have like really well structured social nets, uh, you know, which um, allow people uh, not to be really, um, you know, uh, 
really to be drawn um, into in into excessive working hours, mm-hmm. whereas um, in the east, you know, people um, turn to work um, excessively, uh, you know, just just for a better life. Um, because um, most countries and territories, they don't have a really uh, you know well defined. Uh, well structured social network, um, um, so which in turn you know prevents people uh, you know uh, from seeking uh, uh, long term uh, wellness. Um, say I think I think I think I think it's a culture thing. You know, just in the end, uh, even though uh, you know, uh, like I mentioned before previously, um, you know, uh, Japan, Hong Kong. Uh, the the two most advanced economies in Asia. Um, people um, turn to work excessively. Um, people turn to work uh, for long uh, for long hours. Um, so and 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 the governments, you know, um, really have haven't really put a, a stop to that. I think. Um, I think. In the long term, uh, in terms of seeking well-being and wellness, um, you know, the, uh, from the corporate side as well as from the, the government side, uh, I think we should really reduce the amount of people, you know, uh, 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 working uh, for extra hours. Yeah, absolutely. And Edgar, I wanted to ask you a question because I think you were when we were talking a minute ago, you were talking about the different kinds of um, wealth that you have, and how even though you know the farm has been shut down and, and the salaries aren't as accessible and things like that, and um, how do you then? Um, how do you? How do people eat? How you know? Because obviously, you know, is, is it down to the the strength of the connections and people feeding each other? Is that how? Is that why you were saying that the, the other forms of wealth that come? Um, I guess the the pandemic has allowed an inner virtue of human beings, whether it's west or east. But I'd like to stay away from geography because there's so much, so much east in the western mm. map, and there's so much of the east of the west in the eastern map. Meaning, uh, Jarvos mentioned about I think it's in Europe, for example, yeah. uh, and uh, a lot of my friends from the Philippines are also in Europe. I mean, Philippines is east, and um, so. It allowed this pandemic allowed people to to discover to let out a certain values or traits or survival uh, instincts that are that have been let's say forgotten or not so remembered during better times. And again, when I say better, we always have the tendency to measure in terms of plenty of money, money to splurge. Uh, go to Bali, go to somewhere to enjoy on a holiday. But when we are forced to stay at home, what do we do? Do we go berserk? Do we die of stress? We're not even to visit families from another town. Mm. And even worse stories, more tragic, uh, painful stories of other situations that a family who's sick cannot be visited, a family who's in a nursing home cannot be visited. So it, this allowed us to to extract that inner value. It's called faith. It's called the survival instinct. Uh, and people who lost their jobs, in my case, uh, we laugh about it because now they are forced to so-called eat grass. I really say, eat grass. It's healthy. Uh. Don't eat packaged foods because you cannot afford it anyway. You don't have money from your payslip. You have no job. And then when they started eating grass, then they become more healthy anyway. The high blood pressure is gone. And so anyway, I don't know if I can, if I address your question. Yes. In no, I, I, that's a very interesting answer. And I'm thank you so much for your uh, contribution, Edgar. I'm going to uh, pass to Andy and to Jarvis for a very f- quick uh, last comments on the topic, if they have any, uh, before I say thank you and we end the session. Yeah, I mean, my my point, I think, 
you hear these different, very, very different perspectives, or, or it goes very different perspective. Uh, you know, I think it's you know, can we optimally merge, uh, you know, the East with the West and learn from the mistakes the West have made, um, and you know, it's it's an opportunity uh, for the East or many Eastern countries also to to get, and it's also an opportunity for the West. <laughs> So I'd like to see kind of a, a learning mechanism rather than an adopt, adoption of Western practices or adoption of Eastern practices. Lovely. Thank you, Andy. And Jarvis? Oh, yes, yes. Um, just in summary, um, just of all points I've mentioned, I think um, uh, co- uh, companies and individuals should really seek um, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, appeasement or in, uh, or cooperation in some way, um, just you know, just to um, just to extend well-being and awareness, um, just to to do to, to different groups of people. So, um, so, um, so from the pers- from the perspective of governments, you know, worldwide, especially, uh, you know, uh, in Asia, I think they should be really focused on, you know, uh. uh the long term effect uh, you know of excessive working hours you know uh, for the middle class i think i think that they will just gradually um just you know have an impact um you know on, on well being uh of of people um just you know just just um just in asia yeah absolutely and um thank you everyone who has been watching and thank you guys for your time and your energy thank, thank you for everyone thank you all right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. All the best. Bye. 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 Uh, okay. Can I stop?